Compartment firefighting. Compartment firefighting techniques have evolved considerably over the last number of years. Dublin Fire Brigade has undertaken to keep pace with the changes and is determined to follow best international practice in this very important area. This short film is designed not to replace hands-on training, but to enhance it. One of the aims of the film is to promote a deeper understanding of how fire behaves in compartments. The main objective, however, is to discuss how to fight this type of fire. In the early 1980s, following the deaths of two Swedish firefighters, techniques were developed by Gisselsen and Rosander to protect firefighters from hazards associated with compartment firefighting. These techniques involved recognition skills by firefighters of specific fire characteristics allied with the skillful application of water pulses. These skills and tactics became known as offensive or 3D firefighting. These tactics were introduced in 1999 to Dublin Fire Brigade. The techniques have been refined over the years by the Swedish Rescue Services Agency and UK Fire Services. This training film will reflect that development. Compartment Fire Behaviour Combustion is basically a chemical reaction where fuel combines with oxygen. This reaction requires heat to enable it to work. Compartment fire behaviour follows predictable development phases. These phases are initial fire, growth period, flashover period, fully developed fire, decay period. Initial fire. Fire needs three elements to propagate. Heat, which is the energy. Fuel. Fuel can be found in one of three states, solid, liquid or gas. For flaming combustion to occur, the fuel must be in a vapour state. Oxygen. Fuel mixes with air and reacts with oxygen. Providing these three factors are present in the right proportion, combustion will occur. When talking about how a fire starts, we use the term fire trigger. Fire trigger is the term used to describe the object that has caused the fire. Some examples of fire triggers. Electrical faults. Cooking hobs. Smoking. Arson. Growth period. Pyrolysis is a chemical decomposition process caused by a fuel being exposed to heat. Pyrolysis usually occurs at a temperature range between 100 degrees Celsius to 250 degrees Celsius. Pyrolyzed gases that start burning when they are mixed with oxygen. Some of the gases which accumulate at the surface of the fuel will not combust in the flame. This is because they are too rich or because they have not reached their ignition temperature at this point. These gases, because they are a lower density than air, will rise and form a smoke gas layer in the ceiling. This compartment has sufficient oxygen for continued combustion. This type of fire development is known as a fuel-controlled fire. Combustion in this room is controlled by the fuel's properties and the fuel arrangement in the room. The common gases found in a typical compartment fire gas layer are H2O, water, CO2, carbon dioxide, CO, carbon monoxide, H2, hydrogen, HCN, hydrogen cyanide, N2, nitrogen dioxide. Let us look at the characteristics of flame. There are basically two types of flame, diffusion flame and premixed flame. In most compartment fires, the visible flame is generally a diffused flame. A fire plume normally occurs when a diffused flame spreads across combustible material. Diffused flames indicate less efficient combustion. This flame has a defined outline, appears elongated and occurs when the fuel and air meet. As you can see, the flame appears lazy. A good example of a diffused flame is a candle burning. Diffused flames are usually yellow or orange in colour and result from a combustion process where fuel molecules are mixed with oxygen through laminar or turbulent mixing. 
Laminar diffusion flames are characterized by oxygen and fuel flowing side by side at low velocity. They mix over a long period and produce smooth, long flowing flame. Again, a candle flame being a good example. When the rate at which the fire gases are flowing is higher than that at which it is mixing with the oxygen, the mixing process occurs in turbulent gases. This causes an irregular and uneven combustion resulting in the characteristic turbulent diffused flame. A premixed flame occurs when the fuel and air are well mixed before ignition occurs. The flames therefore burn cleaner. These flames can be blue in color. A good example of a premixed flame is a Bunsen burner with the oxygen aperture open. These flames are far more efficient combustion than diffused flames. This can be measured in higher temperature output and the amount of fire gases remaining unburnt being dramatically reduced. Scenarios involving premixed gases often cause extremely hazardous situations operationally. We will discuss these in detail later in the film. Other factors affecting the growth phase. Passive agents. Passives are present in any combustion process, but take no part in the chemical reaction. They do, however, steal heat energy and will affect the fire's development. Some examples are carbon dioxide, water vapor, nitrogen, ambient air temperature and humidity. The available oxygen supply determines the amount of unburnt gases. The smaller the quantity of oxygen being supplied to the compartment, the larger the quantity of unburnt gases. Room geometry. If a fire starts in a corner, the walls will reflect heat assisting the rate in which the fire develops. If a fire starts in the center of a room, the fire will generally develop slower in this circumstance. Fuel thermal inertia. This is simply a property of the available fuel. The larger the thermal inertia of a fuel, the slower the flame spread. Generally, the denser the fuel is, the higher the thermal inertia is, and the higher its resistance to changes in temperature. Surface direction. Flame spread is mainly upwards. Downward spread is much slower, so that direction of the surface affected determines the growth rate of combustion. As the fire continues to develop, the smoke layer can be seen clearly in the upper part of the compartment. Because the smoke is less dense than the air in the compartment, the smoke has risen and mushroomed across the compartment ceiling. The rate of combustion is accelerating, now producing even more pyrolyzed gases. The gases cannot escape the compartment in this case as quickly as they are forming. The gases are now pressurizing the compartment. The smoke layer can now be called an overpressure area in the compartment. As the fire continues to develop, a significant amount of available air is entrained from the lower levels of the compartment towards the fire. The fire is consuming the oxygen in the air at a greater rate as it develops. This zone in the compartment, because of the negative pressure being generated by the fire, can now be called the underpressure area. Where the overpressure and underpressure areas in the compartment equalize can be called the neutral zone. This area is in the vicinity of the smoke and air interface. This is not the bottom of the smoke layer, but this can be used as a general indicator. The height of the neutral zone is a vital piece of information for firefighters. On opening any compartment, this should be evaluated as part of a dynamic risk assessment. We will return to this in detail later in the film. Flashover period. We can clearly see the flames starting to ignite the fire gases in the ceiling above the fire. This is the start of the flashover period. A flashover is a transition period from where the fire is burning locally until the whole room is fully involved. Flashover is a temperature induced event and usually occurs between 500 degrees Celsius to 600 degrees Celsius. A flashover marks the transition from early fire development to a fully developed compartment fire in which all available fuel vapor is ignited. 
fully developed fire. This stage is reached when a flashover occurs. At this point, fire gas temperatures can reach between 800 degrees Celsius to 900 degrees Celsius. Flames can spread to outside through available openings. Some combustion can occur outside the compartment. Once a flashover has occurred, either the available oxygen or the remaining fuel will control it. If either oxygen or fuel is exhausted, the fire will decay. Decay period. The decay period is the period after a fully developed compartment fire. At this stage, the temperature starts to drop as the fuel is consumed. Recap. So we have seen that a compartment fire can develop in stages that are predictable and recognizable. Initial fire, growth period, flashover period, fully developed fire, decay period. The example we have just seen is a fuel control fire, that is a fire that enough oxygen available for the fire's development to be entirely controlled by fuel type and availability. We have also witnessed a flashover. A flashover is a transition period from when the fire is burning locally to a sustained fully involved fire. Flashover is a temperature induced event. Signs of imminent flashover. Room temperature rises dramatically. Rapid lowering of the neutral zone. Flames start to appear at top of the fire gas layer. Increased rate of pyrolysis. Flames start to spread across ceiling. This period can be very short, sometimes as little as 15 seconds. Statistically, only 3% of fires ever become fully developed. 97% remain localized. Limits of flammability. A flammable gas will only burn in air if its composition lies between certain limits. If too little or too much fuel is present, combustion will not take place. The mixture is then said to be too rich or too lean. If we look at the flammable range of propane, we can see the gas will burn between 2 and 10% propane to air mix. The gas will burn most efficiently, that is, with a maximum force and with a faster and most intense combustion at 4%. This is known as the ideal mix. The efficiency of the combustion process will decrease when the gas concentration to air moves towards a leaner or a richer mixture. The lowest concentration of gas to air mixture that will just support a self-propagating flame. This is known as the lower explosive limit. The highest concentration of fuel that will just support a self-propagating flame. This is known as the upper explosive limit. Flammability limits have a direct relationship to compartment firefighting. Fire gases are fuel. Ventilation controlled fire. As a fire develops, a situation may develop where there is insufficient oxygen available to combust the pyrolyzed gases that have formed. Development is now completely determined by the amount of oxygen available. This type of fire development is known as a ventilation controlled fire. It follows that the amount of oxygen available to the fire will determine whether the fire gases are rich or lean. In some cases the fire may simply go out. If a fire is ventilation controlled and is producing rich fire gases, the introduction of oxygen, perhaps by the actions of a firefighter, will affect the fire's development. In some cases, some fire gases will return to within flammable limits, resulting in a violent return to a fully developed fire. This could result in backdraft. Restricted ventilation during the development of a fire can result in the formation of a large quantity of rich unburnt gases. If an opening occurs through structural failure or the actions of a firefighter, the incoming air can mix with the fire gases, forming a combustible mixture somewhere in that room. If an ignition source is present, that mixture may ignite violently, causing the other gases to be pushed out through the opening.
producing a ball of flame outside the opening. This is a relatively rare phenomenon, but can be extremely hazardous to firefighters. A backdraft is a premix of fuel and oxygen prior to ignition. This results in a very efficient and sometimes violent combustion. Signs of potential backdraft. Ventilation controlled fire. Thick black yellow or brown smoke. Blue flames. Hot doors and windows. Soot blackened windows. Lack of visible flame. Air being drawn in. Low neutral zone. Smoke pulsating. High velocity gravity current. A gravity current describes the phenomena visible at an opening of a compartment where the fire gases are exiting and air is being drawn in. A reliable indicator of a ventilation controlled fire is the higher velocity of the fire gases leaving the compartment when an opening is made. This in conjunction with other signs such as the thickness and the colour of the fire gases can greatly assist in assessing the nature of the fire development. Conversely, a low velocity gravity current observed together with light smoke issuing can be a reliable indicator of a fuel controlled fire. Fire gas explosion. When fire gases leak into an adjoining compartment, there is a possibility that these gases may mix very well with the available oxygen. This premix may approach an ideal mix if an ignition source presents, such as a light switch being activated or even a burning ember turned over by a firefighter. The gases may ignite violently, resulting in a fire gas explosion. This is an unusual phenomenon, but the results can be devastating. Fire suppression techniques. There are three basic branch technique categories available to the firefighter. Direct technique. The direct application of water on the seat of the fire is probably the oldest technique used by firefighters. The jet of water is kept moving. The advantages of this technique are that the fire can be fought from considerable distances. This technique is useful as an exterior tactic. The disadvantages are considerable when firefighters are operating inside compartments, however. Excessive amounts of steam are produced, making conditions difficult and dangerous for both firefighters and victims. Visibility in the compartment is compromised. The jet of water may break up the seat of the fire, resulting in fire spread and may in some cases induce backdraft. Water runoff is considerable, increasing water damage. Indirect technique. This technique was developed in the 50s in the USA. The technique involves using water fog with a wide cone angle. The firefighter applies the water in patterns on all hot compartment surfaces. The patterns vary, but PSV is an example. The object of this technique is to produce large quantities of steam to smother the fire. This is an extremely efficient method of fire suppression if the firefighter is outside the compartment. Because of the large amount of steam generation, conditions inside the compartment would quickly become untenable for the firefighter. Visibility in the compartment will be impaired. Ideally, this technique should be used in conjunction with tactical ventilation before crews enter the compartment. We will discuss this technique later. Offensive firefighting. These techniques were developed in Sweden in the early 1980s. The techniques revolve around the concept of firefighters skillfully applying pulses of small droplets of water in the fire gases, whether the fire gas is ignited or not. 3D skills are door entry, safety zoning, long pulses, sweeps, painting, hydraulic ventilation. Let us look at the basic skills of 3D offensive firefighting. Door entry. The point of entry to a building on fire is the most dangerous opening a firefighter can make. This is because on opening a door or window, we are introducing oxygen to the fire. As we have learned, this can affect the fire's development in several ways. We can change a ventilation controlled fire to a fuel controlled fire, dramatically increasing the rate of heat release 
and accelerating development, we could induce backdraft. Correct door entry technique is vital. Observe how the two firefighters approach this. The branch operator takes up a position low using the wall as cover. The second firefighter establishes control of the door. It is important that they coordinate their work to ensure safety. The branch operator places a pulse of water high on the door. This will give an indication of heat behind that door. The firefighters look at other indicators before continuing. These indicators should include door paint blistering or blackened windows. On a signal, the second firefighter opens the door just enough for the branch operator to see in. The firefighters have specific tasks. The branch operator should look below the neutral zone and try to determine the seat of the fire and scan for casualties. The branch operator determines the height of the neutral zone. At this point, the branch operator places a pulse of water into the overhead and listens to determine if the droplets vaporize or pass through cooler fire gases and hit the ceiling. The second firefighter closes the door quickly on the signal. While the door was open, the second firefighter was observing the fire gases. He will observe the thickness of the smoke and determine the velocity of the gravity current. The two firefighters confer. If the firefighters are not sure, they should repeat the process. Possible outcomes of the assessment. If there are no backdraft indicators and the droplets do not vaporize, then it is safe to enter. If there are no backdraft indicators but the droplets vaporize, then you must change the conditions before entry. So how do you change the conditions? This can be done by either using long pulses or sweeps. After doing this, you must close the door and repeat the temperature check. When the firefighters decide to make entry, they should quickly move through the doorway. Any hot fire gases exiting the compartment will be compressed through this opening, making the doorway an uncomfortable point to remain in. If there are signs of collapse, however, the doorway could be a place of relative safety. Firefighters must be vigilant. The branch man must observe gases in front and overhead at all times. The second firefighter must observe behind and overhead constantly. When the firefighters enter the first compartment, they could find themselves in non-flaming fire gases. It is important that they make these gases inert and prevent the possibility of ignition. They do this using a technique known as safety zoning. This technique involves the firefighter aiming the branch almost vertically. The cone angle should be as wide as the compartment width allows, making sure water does not hit compartment boundaries. The branch is very briefly opened about halfway. The branch is never aimed at the same place twice. This maximizes the cooling effect in the fire gases. The droplets of water inert the fire gas, making them less likely to ignite. Similar techniques are employed to extinguish burning fire gases. These techniques, in conjunction with the education of firefighters in compartment fire behavior, have seen remarkable advances in firefighter safety and efficiency. Safe zoning has two functions. One, to inert non-flaming fire gases. Two, to determine the temperature of the gases in the overhead. This information will assist firefighters in deciding if they should advance if safe, maintain position, withdraw to a safer place. If water droplets vaporize in the fire gases, this indicates that the gas temperature is in excess of 100 degrees Celsius. Firefighters need to change these conditions before advancing. If firefighters cannot change these conditions, they should withdraw to a safer place. How do firefighters change the fire gas temperature? We can lower the fire gas temperature by using long pulses or sweeps. These techniques can also be used to deal with flaming combustion. Long pulses. The basic technique is to apply the pulses into the gas layer, avoiding water contact with the compartment boundaries. This results in several benefits to the firefighter. Fire gases will inert and not ignite. Burning gases will be extinguished and contract away from the firefighter. 
the thermal balance in the room will remain intact, keeping the higher compartment temperatures at ceiling level. This means that firefighters will be safer and more comfortable. Visibility in the compartment will be maintained, assisting rescue operations. Lung pulses are used to deal with flaming combustion. The technique requires a narrower cone angle aimed at an angle indicated by roughly where the back wall of the compartment meets the ceiling. Open the branch enough to apply the right amount of water. Aim for the corners of the room. Rule of thumb. If you hear the water hit the ceiling, you're aiming too high. If the flame frontage expands towards you, you're aiming too low. If the flame contracts away from you, you're aiming in the right place. Apply less or more water as required. As you control the fire, you should advance towards the seat. If long pulses do not control the fire, you should resort to sweeps. You may ask, how much water should we apply? The answer is simple. You should put on no more water than is needed to create the desired effect. Let us see. Too much. Excessive steam is generated, compartment will feel hotter, and visibility dramatically disimproves. Too little. No significant effect on fire or conditions. Correct amount. Conditions improve, visibility remains good, heat reduces. Sweeping. Sweeping is a technique that allows firefighters to cool a larger area of flaming or non-flaming combustion. Firefighters should utilize a narrower cone angle and slowly sweep 180 degrees, holding the branch at an angle about halfway between the ceiling and the floor. This technique can be used for to inert fire gases before compartment entry in a ventilation controlled fire, to change conditions if a safety zoning technique has indicated that gases in the overhead are superheated. Painting. When you get close to the seat of the fire, you should fully extinguish the fire by painting. Painting involves setting your branch to jet and using garden hose water pressure to paint all pyrolyzing surfaces. This will minimize steam production and water damage. When the fire is extinguished, make radio contact with the OIC to determine if venting is appropriate. Never vent without permission. There could be more than one compartment on fire and venting actions could create dangerous changes in conditions. There could be situations where firefighters may have to negotiate several smoke-filled compartments to find the seat of the fire. It is imperative that firefighters safety zone their way through these compartments, making their routes in and out safe. Interior door entry technique. When going from one compartment to the next, it is important that firefighters treat each compartment with the same caution. Fires can be fuel controlled in one part of a building and ventilation controlled in other compartments. Interior door entry technique varies from the exterior technique. Firefighters pulse water on all combustibles around or near the door. This reduces the chance of fire spread should flamey combustion be encountered on opening a door. The interior door entry technique is identical to the exterior method after taking this precaution. Backdraft mitigation technique. This method involves firefighters identifying the signs and symptoms before proceeding. Firefighters should notify OIC of their observations and await instructions. In most cases, the officer in charge will order an immediate evacuation of the building and deal with the backdraft by external tactical ventilation. He may also approve the following. Firefighters will proceed to use an under-pressure, over-pressure branch technique. All actions must be coordinated carefully and in sequence. The branch is directed into the over-pressure region and a long pulse is applied. The door closed and a period of about 10 seconds allowed elapse before reopening. Then a long pulse is applied to the under pressure. Water must be applied gradually. In this instance, it is better to apply too little slowly rather than too much quickly. Gradual application will ensure that the steam pressure produced will not break a window. 
this could induce a backdraft. While this is happening, the OIC will have decided where to make the exhaust vent. Notice that the firefighter is in a safe position and a covering branch is in place. The exhaust vent should be high in the structure and downwind of the inlet vent. The covering branch must never be directed into the compartment at any point. When the gases inside the compartment are saturated with steam, the crew should inform the officer in charge and await instruction. The OIC will order the exhaust vent to be made, followed soon after by an inlet vent. The compartment will then be ventilated of superheated steam. As the fire returns to a fuel-controlled fire, the crew can enter safely and extinguish. This ventilation technique is known as tactical cross-ventilation. Hydraulic ventilation. The branch can be used to assist fire gas ventilation by the firefighter setting up about 2 meters from the vent and opening a cone angle to cover 80% of the vent. Open an inlet vent upwind. Some rules for compartment firefighting. All firefighters committed to compartment fires should have a firefighting branch whether their role is firefighting or search and rescue. Compartment fires can be defined as fires in enclosures of less than 70 square meters with a standard 2.3 meter ceiling height. 3D offensive techniques are not as effective in compartments larger than this. If structural members of a house become involved or if a ceiling breaches, you are now dealing with a structural fire. Minimum flow rates for compartment and structural fires. For compartment firefighting, you need a minimum of 200 litres per minute. That's two first aid reels. This gives the firefighter enough water should the fire develop unexpectedly. A backup 45 millimetre hose line must always be made down from the second arriving pump when crews are committed. This gives the crews a safety margin if the original water supply proves inadequate to deal with the fire. Thank you for watching this DVD and should you have any further questions then please make them known to your officer in charge. Dublin Fire Brigade would like to acknowledge the assistance of the following in the making of this film. Devon and Somerset Fire and Rescue Service Swedish Rescue Services Agency, Revanche College, Essex County Fire and Rescue Service, Fire Services College, Morton.